Hi everyone and welcome to Women vs Everything, a women's history podcast where we focus on women and people of gender diversity identities and we talk about their amazing lives and the things they did to make history. This is my lovely co-host Jess. Hi everyone, really happy to be back. We've had a bit of a break as you can probably tell if you listen to us regularly. We had uh, some health stuff going on and then I went on holiday and then my PhD ate my life. So it's, it's been a minute, but we are very happy to be back and talking to you all again. We're sorry for ghosting you. <laughs> it was not our intention. We'll probably do it again. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, we probably will. Um, but, you know, that's okay. We're both chaotic and all of the things have the health stuff going on. So it's fine. Yeah. And um, also this podcast doesn't pay for itself so it's a real labor of love so Jess would you like to tell the lovely people out there how they can contribute some love to that labor yes if you want to support us and help us keep doing this you can support us on a monthly basis at patreon.com slash women vs everything we have tiers uh, starting from a dollar a month um, and going up from there and there's lots of kind of fun bonus content on there which um, grace is mostly in charge of managing but there's um, some fun outtakes and uh, places that you can do more reading on some of the topics that we've covered and all of that all of that fun stuff. Um, and at some point, there's going to be us rambling about Crazy Ex-Girlfriend for 15 minutes. <laughs> because our editor suggested that we cut that one out of the main episode, which was fair. Uh, you can also send us a one-off donation at buymeacoffee.com slash wveverythingpod. Um, and that all just gets plowed back into making the show amazing, helping us to pay our wonderful editor. And we really do appreciate all the support that we get. Yeah, when the podcast can like pay for itself it enables us to put the content out more regularly by protecting time in our life also if you don't have any money it really helps us if you give us a follow on social media if you share our posts if you interact with our posts and generally feed us attention <laughs> we like attention we like attention uh, yes we are uh, women vs everything on instagram we are women vs everything on facebook uh, we are WV Everything Pod on Twitter, and if you want to get in touch with us, if you want to give us feedback or tell us anything that we got wrong that we can correct on a future show, or if you have any suggestions for women that we should talk about, or if you want to just tell us that we're amazing, we like that too. We are uh, Women VS Everything at gmail.com is where you can get hold of us. 100%. And if you are a woman with a lived experience or you've studied experiences that Jess and I haven't had from our white European experiences, then we would love to have you on the show. We would love to talk about what you've studied or we would love to talk about your life and what things are like in, in your part of the world and existence. That would be amazing. We've had some guest episodes so far and we want to continue that. Yes, please do get in touch if that is you. So... On that note, do you want to tell uh, the lovely people, Jess, about what you've been getting up to that's been, been more important than putting out content <laughs> in the last few weeks? Um, I was hanging out on a volcano for a couple of weeks. My partner and I went to Tenerife, which was absolutely lovely and was a, was a break, which we really needed. That was great. Other than that, I have been, I have been working on my PhD for forever because I've got my upgrade Fiverr coming up in early November. I've actually got a date for that now. So as I'm as we're recording this, I have got six days until I've got to submit the written material. Oh my god, and you're still so, here donating some time. Thank you. <laughs> so that is that is what I've been what I've been doing. What what about you? How how have you been, Grace? What have you been up to? Yeah, so I think I've been the cause of the delay a few times when we've tried to meet in the last few weeks. I'm a very lucky person who got COVID twice in four months. And then in those months in between, chronic sinusitis for the last six weeks, which was very painful. Oh, that is not fun. Yeah, hopefully I'm out of the other side of it now. So it's been less exciting than your life, Jess. But I too have a holiday coming up. Yes, tell us about that. I'm returning to our, our motherland, the city where we both met, Oxford in England. Oh, yes. And we're negotiating, hanging out for a few hours there. Yes, I'm going to come down and visit and it will be so good to see you because it has been far too goddamn long. It's been several years, has it? I miss that place so much. I did watch something 
and it had loads of scenes from Oxford in it. Anatomy of an Affair. Oh yeah. On Netflix. Have you seen that? I don't think so, no. It's um it does have a trigger warning for rape, so it took me like a while to build up to watch it. Um mm-hmm. it's not something that's been recently released. Yeah, it was really good. Really good, a very good drama. Uh yeah, also very sad and disturbing and accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, kind of showing that that deep denial of the patriarchy and that deep denial of of some individuals out there about uh their entitlement and attitudes about other people, you know. Yeah. What uh what platform is it on? Netflix. I'll check it out when I have the brain. Yeah, when you're not in PhD. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm trying to stick to sort of more light-hearted stuff um outside of outside of PhD land at the moment. So uh anything else that you've been reading, watching, listening to? Okay, on light-hearted stuff. So I'm reading this book that's next to me called My Friend Who's a Nurse Gave It to Me. Hi Emma. And it's Adam Kay's This Is Going to Hurt. Which has been made into oh, a BBC drama. Yeah, I've heard of that. And he, there's there's a stage show based on it as well, right? I think he, maybe it's even him doing a doing a thing. Oh, I didn't know that. Does it is it good? Yeah, it's really good, really funny. The book is really, really funny and it's very clever. It's written like diary entries and yeah. I'm also even a bit like that that is also a bit dark because like I do know some people that I've been like this it's so funny and they're like no it makes me afraid to like ever have an operation or like go to hospital yeah. again and I was like eh. yeah and I'm sure I've watched tons of other things but whatever you know the usual uh true crime podcasts and also like generic funny things that I have just to keep noise in the house you know what about you, Jess? What media have you consumed, if any, because you've been to Tenerife? Um, I actually I did a lot of reading on holiday, which was which was good. Just read some nice light-hearted stuff. One mm. of the books that I read was a novel called Double Booked, which is about a young woman who's in a long-term relationship with a man and how she um, comes to understand that she's bisexual and how that kind of changes her life. Nice. Trying to sort of balance the the side of herself that's involved with the queer community and the side of herself that's, you know, in this presumed to be hetero relationship with her boyfriend and that sort of conflict. And it's just very, it's just very relatable as a bisexual millennial. It's just very relatable. (laughs) Um, So I really enjoyed that. We watched the most recent season of Stranger Things as well Ooh. which mm, I, I i'm not sure you could consider it to be light-hearted but it's 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 good it's good we enjoyed that and what else what else what else i've been re-listening to the my dad wrote a porno podcast <laughs> which if you if you just like terrible writing um <laughs> sex written by someone who seems to not understand how sex works it's uh, <laughs> deeply deeply entertaining <laughs> It's been recommended um, to me a lot, actually, but I've never um, never listened to that. And I have a lot of theatre adventures coming up, which is also exciting. Yeah, what's the name of your theatre blog again? Uh, not just the West End. Cool. Yeah, I'm seeing a few things in the next couple of weeks that I'm going to be reviewing, which is exciting. That's very exciting. Is there one in particular you're looking forward to? I am seeing Hamilton for the second time next week, which I'm really excited about. Oh my god. And also, um, do you remember a queer 90s movie called But I'm a Cheerleader? Yes, of course I do. There's a musical of it now. Oh my god, okay. Yeah, which um, I missed it the first time, but it got so many rave reviews that they brought it back. Um, So I'm seeing that in November, which I'm really excited about as well. Uh, I also very recently listened to a podcast called About a Girl. Oh, yeah. Uh, really good. It's uh, basically about the stories of the women, wives, girlfriends, partners behind some of music's biggest names. Mm-hmm. And in some of them, like Angie and David Bowie, it is a bit uh, like... It gives me similar themes to uh, Liv- Mileva Marich, where um, a lot of people say Angie Bowie was like the c- creative director behind, mm-hmm. like came up with the idea for Ziggy Stardust and tell people you're bisexual or tell people you're actually gay or, you know, like yeah. um, basically came up with Bowie, you know. Um, and then some of them are just sadder stories of like, you know, addiction I'm sure, like, some of the stuff around 
Priscilla and Elvis will be quite, yeah, triggering. I haven't seen anything coming up which could be about, like, you know, baby groupies or anything like that, which I think would deserve a whole fucking episode on its own, but, um... God, yeah, definitely. It is really good, like, little short stories. They're they're all about half an hour long. Cool. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. That's been it, yeah. So, our stories aren't an hour and a half long. <laughs> in fact this one is a hundred years long i thought it was another like typo with wrong dates no this is actually people that we're talking about today um lived for a while um not for 150 years like the dates like the wrong dates i gave you on the last one <laughs> anyway do you want to tell the lovely listeners about the info that i gave you and if you've if you figured out who we're talking about I've no idea. You were like, I probably, you can probably guess who this is. And I'm like, I have no idea. Oh, there's a movie that I just assumed you would have seen, but maybe you, maybe you haven't. What? Um... Oh my God, no. I live under a rock, honestly. <laughs> um, so the info you gave me was that it's actually a story of two women. So we're studying a couple today who lived from 1890s to 1990s in East Coast, USA, New York, Massachusetts, Florida. And the themes are women in male-dominated fields, law and psychology, women as inspiration for men's creations, chosen family polyamory, rising, raising children in a wealthy adult household, queerness and bisexuality, and the necessity of hiding all these situations from the wider world. And I got some great resources and really interesting stories from this. I wouldn't be surprised if someone that I found along the way is part of this couple we're talking about. So yeah, Jess, do you want to tell the lovely listeners at home, even though they've already seen the title of the episode, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to tell them who we're talking about today? Yes. Um, so today we are talking about Elizabeth Holloway Marston and Olive Byrne, Ooh. who are both really, really interesting people in their own right. And we're going to talk a little bit more about their kind of early, early lives and some of the things that they, they did and some of the work that they did. Um, but the thing that they are best known for is for being in a polyamorous triad with William Moulton Marston, who was the creator of Wonder Woman. Oh my goodness, okay. Both of these women are credited as being part of the inspiration for the character and possibly even have done some of the work on the on the creation. Okay. Yeah, so I I love this story and there's and this was this was kind of known a little bit, but there was there was a film that came out in twenty seventeen called Professor Marston and the Wonder Women. Oh you know what I've seen that when I say I've seen it, like I've seen the title and then was like Oh I see. Yeah, and it's um we're gonna talk a little bit more a bit later about the the film and some of the some of the problems with that because it is it is pretty heavily fictionalized as a as a story, um, you know, as as these sort of biopics often are. The reason I scrolled past it was I was like, what a cheesy fucking title. <laughs> <laughs> it's entertaining and it's quite sweet, but it's very heavily fictionalized. Okay. Um, a lot of the aspects of it are heavily fictionalized, which yeah, like I say, we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit more about later. But the real story is also really interesting. The real story sounds better, honestly. It's probably a bit less dramatic. I mean, they see, they seem to have added more drama for the film because you know, of course, you need conflict and drama in in a in a film. But uh, that's understandable, I guess. But anyway, so we'll start with Elizabeth. She was born in February eighteen ninety three. Um, she was the slightly older of the two. She was actually born on the Isle of Man, but her family moved to the US um, shortly after and she was raised in Boston in Massachusetts. Mm. What did you find out about kind of America in that in that time? Yeah, so life in the 1890s, I found a text adapted from a KHNS history talk by Ranger Jason Verhage, Verhage in October 2014. And it was like a time of change. The decade prior had been the days of uh, like Jesse James, you know, and Geronimo, like Wild West. But by mm -hmm. 1889, the Wild West was shrinking and the US population grew over 25% in, in 10 years. And more people than ever were living in urban areas. So by the 1890s, with the age of industrialization, people were just as likely to work in a factory as they were on a farm. They listened to news on the radio instead of reading it in the newspaper. Homes were becoming illuminated by light bulbs instead of lamps, thanks to the General Electric. And um, you could order furniture and even homes from the Sears and Roebuck's mall order catalogs, you know. 
Mm -hmm. compared to before you're just like on this new land like yeah go figure it out by yourself by eyes you know <laughs> so um it was a time of economic strife in 1893 the economy crashed because of two major factors railroads and silver basically they overproduced railroads which bankrupted loads of the companies um and those oh really no way yeah those bankrupt i mean so yeah this shit of like stupid people seeing the short-term money and then ruining it for everyone has been going on for a long time <laughs> uh-huh some things never change nope um so those bankruptcies caused something called the 500 Sherman Silver Purchase Act, which was a law which increased the amount of silver the government bought, hoping that that would solidify or strengthen the worth of silver. But instead, people panicked because they're like, oh, does that mean the silver prices are going to fall and my money will be worth less? So mm -hmm. everyone exchanged their silver notes for gold bars uh, to the point that the gold reserves were then depleted to their minimum amount at a federal level and that was also called the panic of 1893 uh, so within the year 15,000 businesses closed and unemployment skyrocketed like New York saw 35% unemployment and it would stay in that depression until gold was discovered in Yukon in 1896 and the Klondike gold rush in Alaska revived the American economy. So, yeah, just just kind of more exploitation of native land there. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the concept of social Darwinism was on the rise and it was a concept that we all function within our society. We owe that society nothing. It was all very survival of the fittest. And it meant anyone could basically just better themselves and their social standing if they had an innovative idea and a strong work ethic. So this, like, moving away from community, basically. Not a great time for women. Um, marriage and motherhood was no. just your most important job, basically. Married women live very restricted lives, just kind of catering to the house and husband. If the family was wealthy, they could hire someone else to do that. But that didn't mean... Oh, now you've time to pursue outside interest. It was just like considered a show of wealth to lounge around and have small hobbies to do, you know. Mm -hmm. With this Great Depression and the urbanization, many women kind of saw the strife and the opportunity for that dynamic atmosphere to be a time for change, basically. Mm -hmm. And for some remaining unmarried was the first rebellion you know, and the first step towards independence. So in 1890, three quarters of the women in the workforce were single. But still, even a single woman's options were greatly dictated by their social class. So if you're from upper or middle class, there was like some money for continued education, uh, but your family might not necessarily even give you their blessing about that. But if you got that education, then you'd some opportunity to create a career as opposed to like just holding a job. And an educated woman might get opportunity as a nurse, a teacher, a secretary, and those women could make more money and work less compared to people of other classes. Yeah, if you're in lower class, you don't have as many options. It was just kind of continue work as a labourer, textile factory workers, maids, laundresses were the most common employments. Yeah. With the panic of 93, then more families gave the blessing for the women to work and continue education because they were like, oh, families can't survive on one income anymore but yeah if you got married or became pregnant you had to leave the workforce anyway and yeah it was really interesting as well around this time there was a big change so in the 1890s fashion was very like puffy sleeves voluminous oh. layered skirts with corsets huh um and it was all like the the thin waist and the big boobs and it was known as the mauve eras because of the dyes available. There was a new dye for mauve or lavender. So that was really popular. And the more expensive a dress was, the more uncomfortable it was, signifying you're a lady of leisure. But with the depression, like women still wore dresses, but attire became more simple and practical. Simpler because the dresses were made cheaper and practical because now women were expected to go out and work or given blessing to do so. So they became more comfortable out of consideration for the wearer and being able to move. Like that's just an example of how much things changed in qu quite a quick time for women. And then there's also the bicycle. Bikes were the new craze in 1890s. And we talked about this a bit mm -hmm. with English suffragettes. 
Um, yeah. So the old fashion really restricted women's ability to even like try it out. But because of the change in clothing, more women were trying it. And then bloomers and loose fitting pants became increasingly popular because you could ride a bike in them. And society frowned on that attire. But like the bike was a symbol of freedom and being able to travel and go off and do your thing and not be isolated. So increasingly like that just made women be like, I don't care if I'm getting looks because I'm cycling too far away anyway. I'm cycling too fast to like take your disrespect. <laughs> so um, yeah, it became a symbol of, of women's suffrage and women's independence, basically the bicycle. Yeah, we love to see it. Yeah, we love to see it. Get on your bike. <laughs> there was the Women's Amateur Golf Championship in that decade. Really? Huh. And the first women's intercollegiate basketball game was played. And there was two all-women ice hockey teams that uh, played each other in Philadelphia. Which is, oh, no way. I know, which I think I think just also shows the gap between that, like, the people who could afford to go to college and the, the people that couldn't, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. But in terms of the freedoms they had and how much they could shake those gender roles and it was okay, you know. And it's interesting, speaking of gender roles and speaking of education, so obviously at this time, very few women relatively went to college, went to university, earned academic degrees. Elizabeth Holloway, as she was then, um, earned three. Um, so she went to... Oh. Yeah, so she went to Mount Holyoke College and received a BA in psychology, um, and then after she graduated from there, she wanted to go to law school, but her father uh, wouldn't pay her tuition for law school. And he's he's quoted as saying, as long as I have money to keep you in aprons, you can stay home with your mother. Gross. Yeah, super gross. But she she wasn't going to give up. So she uh, sold cookbooks to raise the $100 that she needed for tuition for the Boston University School of Law. And uh, to give you some perspective on that, $100 from 1915 is worth just under $3,000 today. Wow. It's about $2,930, which is a lot of money in one way. But then when you consider that the average cost of law school in America in 2022 is $56,000, mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. relatively affordable back then. So anyway, she raised the money. She went to law school. She graduated with an LLB in 1918 and was one of only three female graduates from the School of Law that year. Hmm. Arabella Mansfield was the first woman admitted to the bar in 1869 in Iowa. Wow. So only like a few decades before this. Yeah, but she'd not studied law at school. She'd um, studied in her brother's office for two years and then took the bar exam. But the same year, it was um, a lady called Ada H. Kepley became the first woman in the United States to graduate from law school. So yeah, a few decades before that. Yeah. Um, in 1870, Esther Morris was appointed as Justice of the Peace in Wyoming Territory, first woman appointed to judicial system. And Genevieve Klein was the first woman appointed to federal court in 1928. And she was nominated by President Coolidge. Wow. And she remained there for 25 years. And the U.S. Court of Appeals, Sixth Circuit, got their first woman Supreme Justice uh, in 1932. Mm -hmm. But currently there is only three women on that, which is a third of the body. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's um we, you know, we do have these other outliers kind of paving the way, but it's still so rare, even so many years later, there's only two women graduate from that year, you know? Yeah, which is bonkers, really, mm. when you think about it. The progress has been, like, very slow, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So by the time she graduated from law school, she had married uh, William Moulton Marston. They, they got married in 1915. And he was uh, variously a psychologist, a self-help author, and a comic book writer. Mm. He was what would be considered a radical feminist by the standards at, at, at the time. He was very strongly connected to the women's rights movement. He um, believed that women were at least as good as men, if not superior to men. And he was a great admirer of Margaret Sanger. And put a pin in that name because we're going to hear more about her in a few minutes. So they got married, as I said, in 1915. Um, they were okay. both admitted to the bar. 
and William was doing graduate work in psychology at Harvard um, and meanwhile Elizabeth went and got her MA in psychology from Radcliffe College. She wanted to study for a doctorate at Harvard but the school didn't admit women at the time and Harvard would not admit women until 1920 and even then it was only to the Graduate School of Education. Harvard did not Yikes. go fully co-ed until 1971. 71? 1971, genuinely. Ah, oh, idiots. Yeah, what the hell, America. So she went from law to psychology? BA in psychology, then an LLB in law, and then an MA in psychology. So very, very smart woman. Very smart woman. Oh, okay. So yeah, in psychology, it was um, more common. Like there was in the 1900s, one out of every 10 psychologists in the US were female. Oh, wow. Yeah, Mary Whitten Calkins held a degree in classics and, sci and philosophy in 1897. Um, and three years later, she started teaching psychology. Mm -hmm. But because she hadn't studied it, she, she had to go back and study it for a year. And then basically, because she was a woman, she was not formally admitted and did not receive the degree. But she did then later get a paired associate learning to study memory. Mm -hmm. She got a paired associate learning to study memory, but then someone else claimed credit for her work. Uh, but then Mary Whitten Calkins went on to publish more than 100 papers on psychology and philosophy. She became the first woman to be president of the American Psychological Association in 1905, which is so early. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. And 1933, Inez Prosser was the first African American woman given a PhD in psychology. So it's, it, that seems to be an area that was like accepting women much quicker than law. And I'm sure it has to do with like gender roles that still exist that like, oh, women are better with social skills and people and intuition and understanding emotions. And yeah. Yeah. Um, so Elizabeth had a really interesting and kind of varied career. Just some of the things that she did. She indexed the documents of the first 14 congresses. She lectured on various subjects, including law, ethics and psychology at various American universities. Oh, cool. Um, she served as an editor for both the Encyclopedia Britannica and McCall's magazine. She co-wrote a textbook called Integrative Psychology and... She noticed that blood pressure rises when a person is angry or excited. And as a result of that, along with her husband, they worked on a systolic blood pressure test um, designed to detect deception, which was a predecessor to the polygraph lie detector. Ah, oh, amazing. Which is a problematic and controversial thing that, you know, is, is not... I think considered to be entirely reliable nowadays, but it was uh, it was a, a very interesting kind of invention at the time. Yeah, I mean, as a true crime nut, it's it's really not reliable. If you're ever invited to take one, don't. <laughs> yeah, but you know, plenty of people have like developed unreliable inventions throughout all of history. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's kind of the other thing that William Moulton Martin is known for, apart from Wonder Woman, is the, the thing that would become the, the, the polygraph. I don't think it's the finest of his inventions, but, you know, there we go. During this time, she was also um, working alongside William on some of the work that he was authoring. And a lot of it, she's not credited directly, as is, you know, so often the case with, with women's work, unfortunately, especially at that time. Okay. But his papers and his accounts from the time show very clearly that she was a vital contributor to a lot of the work that he that he was doing. Do we know why she wasn't credited when he's this, like, radical feminist? <sighs> no, it doesn't say. And I that struck me too, because it, it, it seemed to me that a man who was so progressive for the time would have not been okay with that maybe it was out of his hands i i don't know i couldn't find any i couldn't find any info on that which is really frustrating yeah that's very disappointing it's also just possible that he had a bit of a blind spot due to privilege there yeah i mean you know like everyone campaigns for equity until it costs them something yeah it's kind of elizabeth's the first part of her story yeah so then we have Olive. Um, so so Mary Olive Byrne was her it was her full name, and she was uh, known professionally as Olive Richard for some of her life. So she was the daughter of a woman called Ethel Byrne, who was a progressive era feminist activist. And Ethel and her sister Margaret Sanger opened the first birth control clinic in the U.S. 
Wow. Sanger is a very controversial figure. Her work on birth control did a lot of, of, of good for liberating women, but she was also a believer in eugenics. Yeah. <laughs> so she is she is a very complicated figure and sometimes the very dark side of that is is not so spoken about so I think we I think we have to acknowledge that it is not clear from my research whether uh, whether Ethel um, Olive's mother also held those beliefs couldn't find any information either way on that so she's born into this very progressive in another way very very much not family she was actually delivered by her aunt Margaret Sanger when she was born but two years later her mother left Olive and her brother at their grandparents home in order to protect them from their abusive father Mm. and she was pretty much raised by her grandparents until they died in 1914 when she was 10 and then at that point she was sent off to a uh, Catholic orphanage. God that's awful. Yeah it's really sad. So Ethel Burton in 1917 went on a hunger strike She'd been convicted of violating Section 1142 of New York State's Penal Code by furnishing information on birth control to patients at the the birth control clinic that that they'd started, which at the time was the first and only one in in the US. And during that time, while Ethel was doing this this work and doing this this hunger strike, Margaret came to the orphanage and met Olive for the, the first time that she remembered to tell her about her mother and her mother's work but Olive wouldn't see her mother again until she was 16 which was the first time that she'd seen her in 10 years Mm. and she began to sometimes live with her mother and her mother's lover and while she was staying with them she was exposed to a lot of kind of feminist work and particularly to the ideas of sexual freedom and what they called quote voluntary motherhood Mm -hmm. so in other words rejecting this idea that marriage and babies was the only way to be a woman. So she went to Tufts University in Massachusetts, uh, where she studied medicine. She was a member of the Alpha Omicron Pi sorority, and she's described as being, uh, quote, vivacious and having a very sort of androgynous appearance. She had this hairstyle called an Eton crop, which is like kind of short and slicked down and sort of masculine. Mm. And she was known around campus before her connection to Margaret Sanger. And when she was home on the Christmas vacation, she worked at Sanger's Clinical Research Bureau, which had grown from the first legal birth control clinic to like the leading contraception research centre in the world. Wow, fantastic. Great. Yeah. Not so great for eugenics, but yeah. This episode is a bit like bad feminists. <laughs> <laughs> so then we fast forward to... 1925 when okay our three protagonists meet where do they meet for the first time so they met while olive was a senior at tufts university uh she would have been 21 and william and elizabeth would have both been 32 so it's it's quite an age gap when someone's that young i think 21 to 32 is a i say say this as someone who is who is 32 is is a very big difference so william was her psychology professor Mm. yeah And she became his research assistant. He was impressed by some of her knowledge of gender theory. And she actually ended up taking him to her sorority to do some research. He was doing some research on uh, human reactions to power. And one of the things that he studied for that was what were called sorority baby parties, which is this incredibly weird, like, hazing tradition in which the freshman girls were made to dress up like babies and be treated as children (laughs) apparently this was a this was a whole thing this this hazing ritual was a whole thing but it's deeply deeply weird probably less harmful than some of the hazing that happens these days honestly you're, you're probably right to be fair and i'm sure that must have been a very interesting thing to to study with regards to power dynamics which was was one of the things he was interested in mm-hmm. so it's a little unclear quite when or in what circumstances the relationship became closer but what we do know is that olive went to dinner with both of the marstons while she was working with william and after she graduated she moved in with them while she was planning to start a doctorate in psychology 
Uh, but ultimately she dropped out of the doctoral programme. So by this time, Elizabeth had had her first child. She gave birth for the first time at the age of 35. I think nowadays would be considered pretty normal, but at, at the time would have been pretty late for a first, yeah. for a first pregnancy and a first baby. So she went back to work and Olive took over doing some of the childcare for Moulton Pete Marston, who was their first child. And that same year, William published um, something called Emotions of Normal People, which was essentially a defence of a lot of sexual behaviours that were considered taboo at the time, okay. in which he used some of the work that Olive had done for her doctorate, and he dedicated the work to five women, including her. Presumably Elizabeth was one of the others. I don't know who the other three were. I couldn't, I couldn't find that anywhere. Yeah. It didn't really get much attention from the, the academic community. Um, okay. Olive wrote a review of it under her pen name of Olive Richard, but it didn't really, didn't really get any more attention. And he dedicated the book in part to Olive. Did he credit that section of work as being Olive's work? <sighs> yeah, and again, I don't know. It, it doesn't sound like it, which is <sighs> confusing. And yeah. yeah, disappointing, actually. And yeah. again, I don't know the extent to which that was his choice and the extent to which that was the extent to which that that was uh, the rules and norms of the academic publishing establishment at the time. Yeah, no, um, totally. I and kind of hope it was the latter, because if it was his choice, then he's not really walking the feminist walk here. No. Yeah. And for someone studying power dynamics, that's like, OK. <laughs> But like, it's also, you know, that's a really interesting ethical dilemma as well as like, yeah, if you had the opportunity to like use someone else's work, but you get credit for it, would you publish it or try and stand your ground? And it's like, but the work might help hundreds of people if it's published, you know? Yeah, it's a really difficult one. I'm not defending him. It's just like, it's just a lose-lose situation for women, <laughs> basically. Yeah, very much so. So did you, I'm sure there isn't a lot of information, um, because of course, it would have been very, very taboo. And of course, the, the words that we would use now wouldn't even have been invented yet. But did you find anything out about kind of um, polyamorous or multi adult families at that time? I didn't. I mean, I, I did look up a bit about queerness, because I thought we were going to talk about like a lesbian polyamorous couple. Mm. So I found a lot about queerness, you know, and I think it's worth saying like, you know, 1928 was when The Well of Noliness was published. Yes. Which was banned. Go listen to our Radcliffe Fall episode if you haven't. Yes, exactly. Uh, which was a banned novel about femme on femme love. Despite it being the most chaste thing you've ever read in your life. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Which was just talking basically about normalising the feelings of same-sex attraction. So, I mean, that was 1928. And what year did these lot get together? Is it speculated? Uh, 1925 or 26. Yeah. So we're at a point where we can't even talk about feelings that are deviant to man, woman, baby, continue. You know? <laughs> So, like, we're at a point where we can't even talk about normalizing having those feelings. And these yeah. three are in a polyamorous relationship. Yeah. I imagine it would have been heavily frowned on. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I mean, of course, that, that word didn't even exist then. Mm. I think I don't think the word polyamory was coined until, like, 1992 or something. But... Of course, people have been doing these these various forms of chosen family and consensual non-monogamy for forever, really. So a short while after moving in with them, Olive, quote unquote, married both William and Elizabeth. Obviously, it wasn't a legally binding marriage because that's not legal in the US. But she wore these wide band bracelets on each of her arms instead of a wedding ring. And from then on, they would always refer to uh, November the 21st as their anniversary. Hmm. Yeah, it's really sweet. And then um, in 1931, she had her first son, who they named Byrne. And then the following year, she had her second son, who was named Don. And both of her boys were officially adopted by the Marstons. So they'd created this blended chosen family together. So Olive was um, doing a little bit of writing for a publication called Family Circle around that time. And she actually wrote an article about Marston and his work on the polygraph and her experience with meeting him and his children. But she could, did not mention that she had any relationship with him or that two of the children were hers. Because... Mm. Of course, that would be, you know, deeply, deeply frowned upon. She was also helping him with uh, typing out many of his uh, Wonder Woman scripts. 
Oh, okay. We'll talk more about the the kind of Wonder Woman thing shortly, because I think that's really interesting. There is still some debate about what the nature of the relationship between Olive and Elizabeth was. Mm. Many people believe that they were lovers as well, and that's how it's portrayed in the film, for, for sure. But some people believe that they both had a relationship with William, but that their relationship with each other was more sisterly. We don't know for sure personally i feel like i'm more inclined to believe that they also had a relationship with each other for reasons that will that we'll get into shortly but there's this one writer um, noah balatsky who's writing in verge and he says elizabeth and olive were bisexual they didn't just have se- separate sexual relationships with william with william they also had a sexual relationship with each other this doesn't seem like it should be a controversial point And there's a lot of evidence that the Marstons were aware of romantic and sexual relationships between women and that they approved of that, didn't have any issue with that. Well, he wrote a book on it, didn't he? And so Berlatsky and another scholar called Eve Sedgwick both believe that the absence of absolute proof that Elizabeth and Olive had a sexual relationship is not proof that they didn't. Yeah. um, Because queer people had to hide because of stigma, because of the law. Of course. It's not like it was something that they could have just talked about openly. And this was the time where they could have been, like, sent to an asylum and given a lobotomy for that. You know what I mean? It's not just the law. It was also, like, they could die if people find out about it, you know? Right, exactly. It's incredibly, incredibly dangerous. So... There's a woman called Christy Marston, who is William's granddaughter. She's had a lot of issues with the film in particular, and she's, you know, talked about some of the ways in which that it's fictionalised, and she, you know, doesn't really approve of that. But she she feels very strongly that her, her grandmother, Elizabeth, and Olive were, were essentially sisters, were not lovers, just shared the same male partner. I don't know. Um, but, I mean, if whether there was sex or not, there was a commitment made and there was well, an emotional exactly. and social relationship. So it's kind of like, are we adhering to this hierarchy where sex is the most important definer in, in whether people are in a romantic relationship or not. Well, exactly, exactly. And I, I've, I've written this in my notes as well. Like, ultimately, I'm not really convinced that it matters all that much. Um, yeah. I think it's it's a love story between three people, ultimately. Exactly, yeah. It's a committed love story, quite possibly romantic, if we look at a wide definition of romance. Yeah, they shared a life, they raised children together, they had this unconventional family that they built at, at significant risk at that time. Yeah. I feel like who who exactly was sleeping with who is the least interesting bit about it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, like, does it change anything about the interpretation of the situation if they were? Yeah, it's interesting to think about kind of the, the evidence either way, but I just don't also don't think it matters all that much. Yeah. Yeah, so then we get on to Wonder Woman. The thing that mm. you know William Moulton Martin is is by far the best known for, and it's generally accepted that the character was modelled on both Elizabeth and Olive. Both of them are described by this writer called Jill Lepore as quote embodying the feminism of the day. Oh, wow! And she wrote this book called The Secret History of Wonder Woman, which came out in twenty fourteen, which um, talks a little bit more about this story. And the New England Historical Society says quote. Though Wonder Woman was liberated and super competent like Elizabeth, she was physically modelled after Olive Byrne, thin, black-haired and blue-eyed. Olive also wore heavy silver bracelets that inspired Wonder Woman's bullet-detecting cuffs. Oh, okay. Which were the yeah, commitment you... bracelets. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly how much import the two women had into the actual creation is debated. No one really knows for sure. There are quite a lot of sources that uh, claim that it was Elizabeth who told William that this superhero character that he was creating had to be a woman. Mm. But anyway, he's quoted as saying that he envisioned Wonder Woman as, quote, a powerful yet compassionate role model. Mm. Mm. Accurate. It's really interesting, this um, this sort of combination of these two women that he loved, that he used to create this character and that they, you know, may have had some kind of input into creating as well. So Wonder Woman debuted in this uh, two-part story that came out in uh, All-Star Comics in 1941 and Sensation Comics in 1942. And there's an article in a publication called Mythic Markets that um, kind of talks about the sort of political and ideological ideological um, components of those of those comics and they say quote 
We may imagine Wonder Woman's status as a feminist icon to be modern revisionism or corporate virtue signalling, but in fact the origins of the character were deeply political and idealistic even in the 1930s. Mm, for sure. And uh, Marston himself is quoted as writing, Frankly, Wonder Woman is psychological propaganda for the type of woman who, I believe, should rule the world. Okay, that sounds fair. <laughs> that sounds like heaven. <laughs> So 1930s, you know I love my timelines. In May of 1930, Amelia Earhart was the first woman, second pilot ever to fly solo non-stop across the Atlantic. So I'm, yeah, I think that's interesting. And, and uh, was the original Wonder Woman also able to fly? I know there was some like invisible plane stuff going on I at some point. I don't remember, maybe. Yeah. Oh, Margaret Sanger Center is mentioned here as well. In the 1916 was when she opened her first birth control clinic. Yeah, Sorry. I'm not, not at all surprised. She was, a, she was a big deal at the time. So I guess in the time he would have been writing it, like if we look at like the 1920s, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was officially part of the US Constitution. And that was August 26th, which was in the 70s designated to be Women's Equality Day. Huh. Yeah, so the ratification of the 19th Amendment was declaring the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. And it's mm -hmm. nicknamed the Susan B. Anthony Amendment in honour of her work on behalf of women's suffrage. Mm -hmm. In July 23, Alice Paul got delegates of the National Women's Party gathered at Presbyterian's church to call for equal rights amendment to be added to the US Constitution. Yeah, so it, like it was a real whirlwind at the time for for women's rights basically. Yeah, absolutely. So this is really interesting time for this this character to appear and who has lasted for all these decades and is still um you know this kind of really iconic figure. So how did people generally respond to the Wonder Woman comic? Was it very popular? Was it controversial? Was it um, yes and yes, it was it was popular and it was controversial. So there was this organization called the National Organization for Decent Literature, and <laughs> oh they, no, yeah. I hate them already. <laughs> and uh, right, and they were this very very influential censorship group that was uh, mostly active between the nineteen thirties and the nineteen sixties, mm. and they banned the comics because of Wonder Woman's costumes. According to a Smithsonian report, there is a bishop who is quoted as saying, Wonder Woman is not sufficiently dressed. <laughs> <laughs> it was also um, placed on a blacklist of, quote, publications disapproved for youth. And it was a massive um, point of controversy, um, the way that people felt that um, sexuality was being portrayed. In this book, I mentioned the secret history of Wonder Woman. Um, Jill Lepore writes... During congressional hearings into juvenile delinquency, Wonder Woman was accused of inciting lesbianism. Which, I mean, not how that worked, but okay. <laughs> she didn't cause it, but I mean, you know, if you had an inkling, she might have, yeah, she might have been that inkling. <laughs> <laughs> might have awoken something, maybe. So it was a little controversial. Some of the, the early comics, if you look at them now, it is like, I do, I do think, wow, I'm amazed they got away with that in the, uh, in the 19th 30s and 40s yeah and it says here like from the 1920 to 1945 this is like a paper called imagine my surprise women's relationships in mid-20th century america it's kind of like between 1920 and 1945 there was this like gay panic about like the sexual invert you know there's these these hidden lesbians everywhere and we need to watch out for them you know and that's probably kind of part of what was going on around the time that um the well of loneliness was published and then subsequently banned yeah exactly wonder woman wasn't banned thank god well yeah this this organization tried and it seems like that they did they did ban it for a while but obviously it was enormously successful they didn't uh, didn't get very far with that um so while william was kind of trying to establish himself with the wonder woman comics elizabeth was kind of the main breadwinner of the family 
So she was... So all three of them were working? Well, William and Elizabeth were working. Um, Elizabeth was, uh, from 1933, she was working as the assistant to the chief executive at Metropolitan Life Insurance. Okay. And Olive was primarily raising the children. Yeah, her writing work was quite occasional then. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It seems like she was sort of doing, doing a little bit of that on and off. Her main role in the family at this point was homemaker. Okay. They all lived together for many years, but obviously they kept the details of their relationship a secret. They told census takers that Olive was Elizabeth's widowed sister-in-law. Okay. And they told William's mother that Olive was their housekeeper. Yeah, I can't imagine how society would have begun to react to a relationship like that at the time. So I think it's I think it's pretty understandable that um, they needed to to keep that under wraps. As we've said, both of the women had children. And they each named one of their children after the other. Would like say say like the mother in laws and family and close friends were they told that all three children were William and Elizabeth's? Well, I, I managed to find out what Olive told her children. She told her boys that their father was a man named William K. Richard, who had died shortly after they were born, and they were not told of their true parentage until nineteen sixty three. So I presume they must have told family the same. Yeah, okay. And the, the oldest child is quoted as saying, the whys and wherefores of the family arrangements were never discussed with the kids, ever. It does say that Olive's mother and her brother did not approve of William. Yeah, I can imagine. Presumably they did know what was going on and they, they seem to have not been uh, too happy about it. Yeah, I can imagine. Which, you know, I, I understand, especially at that time. Yeah, yeah. And there's still, you know, that, that thing of like the power imbalance of this older guy who was her teacher, who had known her from a quite young time. Yeah. This big commitment, very young, you know, those would still be quite red flags today. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and it, it does seem to have worked out in this situation. But I, I mean, certainly if a 21 year old told me that they were moving in with their married professor and his wife, I'd be like, you sure, babe? <laughs> that seems it seems like that could go wrong in a number of ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then William died from cancer in 1947. Oh. Uh, he was only 53 at the time, so he, he died very young. Um, but Olive and Elizabeth continued to live together and raise their children together for the rest of their lives. Oh, wow. Oh, that's so yeah. sweet. Yeah. And again, more evidence that, you know, sexual or not, that, like, that was a relationship, you know? Right. Yeah, that they were they were family. They were partners, absolutely. They were not just two women who were sleeping with the same guy. They were they were absolutely devoted to each other. Mm. So Elizabeth continued to work for uh, MetLife for the rest of her career until she retired. Um she put all four of the children through college. Oh my god. Yeah. And Olive died in 1990 in Florida where they were living at the time. Uh, she was 86. And Elizabeth died in 1993, one month after her 100th birthday. Oh my goodness, wow. Yeah, so a lot of very long lives, yeah. The fact that they lived together for, you know, 40 more years after he died, I think is just really beautiful. Absolutely. Oh my god. So then we have this film, Professor Marston and the Wonder Women, which ostensibly told this story which came out in in 2017 it got mixed reviews it didn't do particularly well in the box office i, I suspect a lot of people just kind of didn't really I think people just didn't really know what it was yeah and the the title itself so like my issue with the title is you know you get his name you get to know what he does for his career you get his educational status and the Wonder Women. So I thought this was a story about like a professor and his secretaries. You know what I mean? Why does it centre him? Yeah. So like I was just immediately like bleh from that title. So, you know, they could have come up with a much edgier name that I think would have drawn more intrigue and it would have done better at the box office. And, you know, that's why Netflix should hire me, even though I have limited <laughs> writing experience. But I'm so good at judging. I'm very good at judging Jess. <laughs> It's a really beautiful film, uh, if you just take it as a film, but okay. it has been criticised for taking very, very significant liberties with the truth, okay. um, which honestly is probably to create a cohesive narrative and fill in the gaps because there are so many aspects of the story that we just don't know for sure. Hmm. You can take it 
as a possible interpretation, but it not really as a historical fact. So, so Christy Marston, who I mentioned earlier, um, William and Elizabeth's granddaughter, she very strongly objected to the way that the film was presented as a kind of true or true-ish story. Mm. Um, so a couple of examples. There's a scene early on in the film where um, Elizabeth and William are using the lie detector to get Olive to admit that she's got feelings for them. Oh, God. Which is not cute. That's creepy. <laughs> That's creepy. It's a weird scene. Yeah, it's odd. And there's a scene much later on where um, the, all, all three of them are having sex and they get caught by a, a neighbour and... And all, all of this is, like, there's no evidence for any of this. All of this is, is completely fictional. Yeah. Which I'm really glad about because the lie detector thing is creepy. That would really, like, significantly change my reading of this story if that was... Older couple takes advantage of young student. Yeah. So the neighbour catching them was just to add some drama. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also this whole bit where they break up and then Olive moves out and then they come and find her and tell her we can't live without you and she comes back and none of that, none of that is, is generally believed to have ever happened. It seems like it was actually a pretty stable family situation. Okay, yeah. So, fun fact, both Olive and Elizabeth have asteroids named after them. <gasps> oh my god! Yeah, the asteroid 102234 Olive Byrne and the asteroid 101813 Elizabeth Marston. And these official naming citations were published by the Minor Planet Centre in September 2018. Fab. So there we go, that's the story. It's a little little bit of a different one this week, but uh, I thought we couldn't talk about one of them without talking about both of them, so I thought I would just wrap it all up into one story. No, that's great. It had twists and turns and things I didn't expect, and yeah, and it all ties into Wonder Woman. Shall we do Gratitude Corner then? Basic bitch Gratitude Corner. Um... <laughs> I just said to Jess that I started a new job recently, so I'm I'm grateful for that. The people, the colleagues there are really nice, mm -hmm. so grateful for all of them. And um, yeah, I'm grateful to have the means and the health, hopefully, to go on holidays and see everyone in Oxford again. Um, and to hopefully meet up with you, Jess, for a coffee. Oh my god, we could get a coffee together. <laughs> <laughs> oh so much coffee it's gonna be so great <laughs> and um yeah i'm like i'm really grateful for um oh my god it was my birthday two days ago oh yes of course happy birthday for two days ago yes did you did you have fun what did you do i had a quiet one this year i usually am like that bitch where i'm like everything is my birthday month and i throw <laughs> a party and i get loads of attention and then this year i was just like absolutely not able for any of that so i was just like had some chill time. So yeah, I'm really grateful for my family. I just had a takeaway with them last night and I spent Tuesday night with the bunnies, which was very lovely. And uh, one more thing, grateful for modern medicine. I mean, Jesus Christ, I would definitely not have survived medieval times. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, me neither. I would have been dead so many years ago. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just like, if the zombie apocalypse ever comes, I'm just calling it a day because my lungs do not work without medication. So, mm. so I'm always very, very grateful for modern medicine and also ancient medicine because I'm getting some acupuncture later today. So excellent. And are you finding that's helping? Yeah, I had one last week. It was just very sore and uncomfortable. So yeah, I'm not going to book in more after this. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. It's not like one of these very relaxing acupuncturists. It's like sometimes the sessions feel like five rounds at Mike Tyson, but um, <laughs> but it works really quick. So I've been getting acupuncture for my sinuses to just like really ensure that I'm um, well enough for the flights next week. Um, yeah, and that's me. What about you, Jess? What good things are happening for you right now? Um, I am grateful that we can travel again. It was so, so lovely to go away and to have a have a real break and to just kind of escape from the world for a couple of weeks. Especially because, wow, the UK has been a whole thing for the last few weeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we have a new prime minister. We have a new monarch. We have a worsening cost of living crisis. It's fine. Everything's fine. No, it isn't. So it was nice just to get away and escape for... Uh, for a couple of weeks that was that was really lovely i'm re also really grateful that i'm going to probably get to see you in a couple of weeks because it has been 
way too long. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. I really, I really want to make this work because it's going to be so much fun. Yay! What else? What else? What else? What else? I continue to be grateful for theatre and all of the wonderful things that it has brought to my life. I'm really kind of enjoying falling back in love with that again and getting to see lots of stuff and review lots of stuff. And yeah, it's, it's nice. Okay, I think that is us uh, wrapping up for this week. So thank you everyone so much as always for listening. And until next time, be wondrous and love women. Bye! Bye! I'm not going to say incite lesbianism and love women, but God, I want to. Incite lesbianism, oh my God, yes. (laughs) 